Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, rethinking China. We're considering it in respects of poverty. But perhaps my topic should also be rethinking the world in respects to poverty. I'm going to start by giving you a small anecdote about my arrival in China. I arrived in China in 2006, uh, late January. It was a rainy evening. I landed in Pudong Airport. And I never forget this. This is one of the most uh, pressing things that have stayed on my mind. I got in the taxi, and what followed was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences of my life. I swear to God, I sat in the car, braced at the back, thinking I'm going to die. I thought this guy was going to crash into everything. It was raining. I thought the car was going to slide everywhere. I was terrified. The good news is I, I got to the hotel okay. We didn't crash. Eight years on, I've been wondering to myself, you know, why do I see so few accidents, high-speed accidents? I see lots of fender benders. I see loads of accidents in Shanghai. I mean, we've all experienced the roads in China. You, you wonder, like, why, you know, why? I travel on the highways all the time to Morgan Shan, and I see accidents, but, you know, they're not as, as regular as I would see them in South Africa. So it got me thinking, I want to look at the stats a bit. So I looked at the stats, and I compared three different states or provinces, you might call them. I compared Gauteng, which is a, the most wealthy area of South Africa, and California and Shanghai. And I looked at how many people die per 100,000 people. And I was shocked. You can see the numbers above you. Only four in Shanghai. And I said, that just can't be true. It just can't be. I mean, you walk onto the street, you think you're going to die. <laughs> but it's a perception. It's something that, and the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is that it's so easy to look at something through a Western set of eyes and think that something just can't work, but the outcome can be quite different. So I'm going to tie that in today a little bit with poverty. Now, the World Bank defines poverty as follows. Poverty is hunger. Poverty is the lack of shelter. Poverty is being sick and not being able to see a doctor. Poverty is not being able to go to school, not knowing how to read, not knowing how to speak properly. Poverty is not having a job. Fear of the future, living one day at a time. Poverty is losing a child to in illness because of unclean water. Poverty is powerlessness, a lack of representation, and freedom. It's a serious topic. It's something that is very close to me because I come from South Africa. And we have serious poverty problems. But this is not a South African or African problem. This problem is experienced all over the world. So I compared these three places again. Gauteng, California, Shanghai. Now, when we take the definition of the World Bank, one of the points is without shelter, without a home. So I wanted to just cross-reference. What's the difference? Well, I know in South Africa, poverty is bad. And I know lots of people don't have homes. And we have what we call shanty towns or slums. Or a nice way of putting them is illegal settlements. Uh, you know. So in South Africa, we see that 23% of the people in the richest part of South Africa don't have a home. California, surprisingly, 20%. I mean, this is, we were just looking at the Hollywood pictures in the previous talk. A lot of those people live in shelters, state-funded places where people can live. Freebies that people give them to live that way. And then you look at Shanghai. It's difficult to get the exact numbers. Let me you know, reference that first. It wasn't easy. Um, but from personal experience, I've traveled all over China. My business is in rural China. And we're building more resorts around China. And I go and experience third, fourth, fifth tier cities. I'm yet to see a single shanty town 
Where the hell are the poor people living? Why don't they have homes? Well, there must be people lying on the street somewhere. Yes, I see a few in Shanghai, here and there. But nothing like I saw when I lived in Manchester or when I lived in Cape Town. So I started to think, hang on a second. Are my perceptions, are my Western glasses that I have skewing my understanding? When I first came to China, I thought, well, look, China's a developing nation. Just 30 years ago, you know, there was, this was a starving nation. Surely, this nation must suffer equally or even more greatly than the Western and developed world. But somehow, these numbers don't add up for me. All right? It's, but they're true. I see it with my own eyes. Now, poverty directly relates to crime through drugs. This is a proven fact on many, many articles, and you can read it all over the world. And we can all say that living in Shanghai must be one of the safest places ever, anywhere in the world. Oh, okay, my reference point is not so safe. So South Africa is not the safest place in the world. So I can, uh, you know, I can say there's few people out there who would question that statement. But poverty, drugs, crime, they all relate it. So I have to ask myself, like, why is this? So I'm going to go back eight years. In 2005, I did an MBA. Um, and our school requires us to do a research report. And uh, at that same time, I read a book by C.K. Prahlad called The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Now, being an insufferable entrepreneur looking to make a buck any way I can, I uh, figured, well, there must be like a business opportunity to sell to the poor. I mean, that would be brilliant in Africa. I'll be a billionaire in no time. So I was, I was, I was quite fascinated about it. And um, so the premise of his book, he seeks that, in order to alleviate poverty, you have to find a way to integrate the people, the poor people, into the economy, make it an inclusive economy. He goes further to say that if you don't, the poor are forced to pay a penalty for being poor. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to show you some of the outcomes of my empirical research to try and prove his point to be correct in South Africa. This research has been published. So it's, it's, it's a proven empirical, well, whatever they say in academic talk. So um, the first thing we look at, quite simply, we take a basket of goods. In South Africa, we, it might not have been rice and, and, and soya sauce. We used you know, potatoes and uh, uh, you know, cigarettes and oil. and So the basic stuff that people in South Africa would need to live. We take that basket of goods and we price it in the poor areas, and we price it in the middle income areas. And what we find is something quite remarkable. Well, maybe it's not so remarkable for you, but the poor are paying 16% more than the middle income. So how the hell are you supposed to get out of being poor if you're paying more than the guy above you? And why is that? You might, all might be asking why, why, why? Well, simply, it's, it's actually two very simple reasons. One is the poor guy, he might not have a car, or he can't afford to drive four kilometers to the discount supermarket store, so he's forced to go and buy at the local shop. He can't afford to buy a 10 kilogram bag of sugar, which you would buy. He has to go and buy a little sachet this big, which is more expensive because it's packaged in some funky little packaging. So everything in the system, the economy, the way the system works in the West and South Africa, forces this penalty on poor people. Telephones, 43% more. I mean, here's a dude who's got a small, you know, he's got his iPhone, he's got to pay, prepay his phone. I, I got credit, I can get a contract. I pay 43% less than him. It's ridiculous. Electricity, okay, now I, I must say, this stat is, is rather unique to South Africa, but poor people, because they don't have credit, have to pre-buy their credit at certain places which aren't available everywhere. And you have to travel vast distances to get it and pay, end up paying 60% more for, for electricity. I, I, there, there are dozens more in, in the research. I just pulled out three for your examples. Now, this problem is not a South African problem. Bl please, don't think this is only in South Africa. There are dozens and dozens of research reports that show this problem to be all over the Western world, in America, in Europe, 
everywhere. So I, I left it. That was the end of my research. I thought, well, you know, that was done. I passed my MBA. I was, Great. Um, and I came to China a year later. And in the eight years I've been in China, I realized that everything I wrote in my book was false here. It doesn't apply to China. Somehow China's different from the rest of the world. The food, now qualified, this is not empirical research. This is my I and me research. Um, <laughs> So I e goes down to the food market and I get her to get me a whole lot of prices. I, I said, look, what are the basic things we need to live here? Okay, rice and oil and soy sauce and basic things. And I said, okay, you go down to this place and this place and this and go get the prices. All right, that's my research. It's not empirical, but it's a good enough analogy for today's talk. 2% less for the basic food goods. I mean, that's an 18% difference from the, the, uh, the, the South African place. Okay, telephones is about a wash, all right? In some parts of Zhejiang, where, where we work, the prices are cheaper for the poor. Here in Shanghai, there is a bit of a decrease. If you have a contract, you can get a better deal if you buy bulk, and it's quite complicated. We'll call it a wash. Electricity, wow. Barack Obama would love this system. In China, I don't know if you guys know this, maybe some of you don't, but in Shanghai, if you have a small house and a one bedroom, and you use only so many watts of power, you pay less. From the guy who has a bigger house, the unit price increases at the more you consume. It's a perfect weighted scale. So the poor guy is paying a little bit, and the rich guy is paying a lot. Barack Obama would love it. Brilliant system. I mean, here you see something completely weird. How the West, where we live, we spend our lives trying to give to the poor to keep them alive. Here in China, I don't see many poor, but they seem to be doing just fine. And I promise you, the government's not giving to them freely. This interesting little statistic actually caught my attention. I was with Rupert re recently, and um, he said to me, 97% of the people of the top 1,000 billionaires in China are first-generation wealth. To me, that's a direct correlation to this and the fact that anyone has an opportunity to succeed in China. No other place in the world is this the, the, the fact. The rest of the world, old money has a big part to play in the development of billionaires and successful people. But in China, it's fair game. Anyone can succeed, no matter how poor you are. So, I've got to tie this in and try and explain to you how China does it. How do they manage to get the prices less? Why don't we do the same in the West? Well, it's, it's much more complicated than that. It's a way in which you make an economy inclusive. Now, there are lots of research reports on this too, and some books recently that I've been reading, but very few of them speak about how China does it. So that's what I'm speaking about today. China includes everyone in the economy. It becomes an inclusive economy. I'm sure some of you are wondering, what does inclusive economy mean? I must be honest with you, I, I never like these big fancy words. But I'll, get, I'll give you a simple anecdote of what, what it means. All right, tomorrow, Julie, I can take you out for lunch. And we can go and eat at our local little place near our office, and we can pay five RMB for lunch. But then I might go and take Andres, you, for lunch tomorrow at the Bund, and we'll have 250 RMB at the bunt each, so 500 RMB. Now, what does that mean? It means that anybody has the opportunity, no matter where you are on the social rung, you can transact with what you can afford. There's no other city in the world that you can spend five RMB to get lunch. I promise you, you can't do it in London or New York, not in downtown, all right? That's what it means to be an inclusive economy where you give everyone a chance to be a part of the economy, make them feel that they are part of civilization, of society. And once you do that, you start to change the dynamics of the poor. And that's how only 2% of the population in Shanghai are living homelessness. So, I'm gonna conclude, and I'm gonna leave you with two points. 
The first point is to change, to change a nation, to change poverty, perhaps it's about time we stop looking at our ideas of what's right and wrong and look to China for solutions. Let's stop rethinking China, let's rethink the world. Poverty is one of the greatest problems facing the world. And it's growing in every nation around the world, bar here. For whatever reason, this country, it's not growing. But 20% of the people in California live without a home. First point. Second point, take your Western glasses, the glasses that you've arrived in China with, and throw them away. Looking at China through the eyes and the perceptions that we've grown up with, will not work, just like my car story. But, please, please all of you, don't go down Yananlu, stop your car on the highway, and reverse if you miss the exit. <laughs> I honestly can't say you'll stay alive. Thank you very much.